Welcome to God of Rock. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. My very special guest today is Kaz Mate. I heard about Kaz through a prior guest, Marnie Runstreet, also known as Marnie Kunz. So Kambadi is a gym in the Lower East Side, and it was started by my friend Kaz, who was formerly incarcerated, and he came up with the idea when he was in prison. It read like a flashback from Orange is the New Black, the story of a man that was running the largest drug delivery service in New York City that became his own job creator because he couldn't find a job. He opened up Con Body, a full body workout using minimal space and practically no equipment. I'm honored to have Cause as a guest. Thank you, Will. Appreciate it. You know, I was looking at those videos from the TED what a, what a great honor that is to get in front of all those people and tell your story. Yeah, it was an amazing experience. I did two TED Talks, and I might be doing a third one now. But um, the first one, I was extremely nervous. Uh, I thought it was like the first time I was on stage in, uh, ever in front of a huge crowd like that. So it was uh, very, very nerve-wracking, but it was, um, it was good. And then you did another one, I think, overseas. Was it in Hong Kong? Yeah, so Hong Kong was an experience. It was totally different, totally different de demographic. The last one I did was in Hudson, New York. And when I went into Hong Kong, I got like a standing ovation for like selling drugs. And they're like, you were running one of the largest drug delivery services. Yay! And I'm like, no, this is not what America cheers for. You know, so it was, uh, it was, it was a funny experience. Um, but they, they, they respect the business aspect behind it. Interesting, yeah. Let's introduce you to our audience. Tell us uh, where you were born and what was it like growing up? So I was born and raised in the Lower East Side of New York and um, Manhattan. And... Um, my mom immigrated from the Dominican Republic in the mid 80s and I was born. She came when she was six months pregnant with me and I was the first American born citizen in my family. And we uh, came and we struggled for a little bit. You know, my mom worked at a factory right on Bleecker Street. As a kid, not having a lot of stuff and people around me, you know, having other stuff more than, than I, I would, you know, be asked like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would tell them I wanted to be rich. Uh -huh and due to like the circumstances that I was living in, the building that I grew up in, and the people that I was influenced by, I began, you know, selling drugs at a very early age, and that was like where, where I became rich. Uh, and that's what I learned, you know, early on, is to hustle no matter what. And okay. that's the guys, I, I looked up to all the guys in the street. Okay, court. when you say by a very early age, I think it was like 11? Yeah, when I was 11 years old, I started messing around. Did you start by trying out the product? I think you started smoking marijuana? Yeah, I started smoking weed, and and then I became like the kid in the school, like, you know, who could find a weed, and it just became like a demand from there. And then, you know, people that I knew in the neighborhood, and it was just, it, you know, I bought my first ounce of weed uh, from my cousin who passed away last year. Sorry to hear that. From a drug overdose, but. Okay. Um, all right. Sounds, uh, I was going to say interesting. That's not the right word. But it, in a sense that obviously the story is different for you. Yeah. But it's, it's not the same for family members. Some yeah. stay in the business yeah. or stayed addicted yeah. and they face the consequences. You know, I guess a popular kid at, at school, even though you were doing drugs because it, was, it sounded so cool, yeah. you know, to be able to be your own person. Yeah. So, growing up, who did you look up to? I know you wanted to be rich. Was that the was that your main goal? Was to have money? That was my main goal. And the guys that I looked up to were, you know, people who were hanging out in the corner with big chains and had the cars and had the girls. And I was like, this is what I want to do. Very young, and my mom would leave me on the corner sometimes, or in the park where the guys, you know, were hustling. And um, that was my childcare sometimes. And you were very observant, and you and you absorbed what they were. Yeah. They weren't necessarily trying to teach you, but you were just taking it all in. Yeah. This this is your your school of hard knocks, as they call it. That's it. That's it. That was my. That's, that's where I learned from. Eventually, you became the the kingpin. 
you know, how did you, did, how did you make that transition from 11 year old learning on the streets to being, you know, a top of the heap? You want to really learn how to sell drugs, right? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, it was it was crazy. I started selling drugs for this guy, uh, coke and crack, and and then from there I changed the way we sold drugs. Uh, nobody was really doing a delivery service, uh, and we had this is when like flip phones were coming out, and we started doing deliveries. And everybody on my team wore you know business suits, ties, and. I was getting a product for really cheap from different places. When I started like changing the way we sold was like 16, 16. years old, yeah. So you saw these new flip phones and, and your thought was, hmm, I think I have an opportunity to expand our market, the yeah. delivery service. Yeah. Okay, so that took off beyond your dreams and yeah. you were making, at the height of your scheming, how yeah. much money were you bringing in? Over $2 million. And yeah. how much taxes did you pay on that? Zero. <laughs> Zero, but you know that's how Al Capone got caught. They confiscated, yeah. I guess. So you didn't have a, a smart accountant to protect you? Uh, no, not, not one that protects me. <laughs> that's the movie stuff. This yeah, is real life. Yeah, this is real life. So how did you get caught? Somebody told on me, one of the guys that was working for me, but uh, the guy, so I had dispatchers. The dispatchers would receive the call, and I had them set up in a nice condo and everything. And, and then they would... Um, you know, make delivery, uh, hand over the work to the drivers, and the drivers would make the delivery. So this dispatcher decided to start another phone, separate phone on, on behind my back. Uh, one of the clientele that I had for a very long time, who had my personal number, calls me and was like, you know, this guy's selling some different stuff. And he tried to give me a different card with a different number. And I was like, what? And then I confronted the dispatcher over the phone I uh, shut, I had a connections with phone lines and stuff, so I shut all the phones down, took over the phones, and then I went to confront him and he like robbed me for a whole bunch of stuff. But not knowing that that phone that he was operating out of, that he created, was being tapped by federal agents. But I didn't know that, and he didn't really know that. And I, I kept sending my workers to, you know, using that phone he created. Okay. And then they got cells and, so All right, somebody you were else busted. Told, yeah. And how old were you? I was 23. 23. When and that was wasn't busted. the first time you went to prison, right? You had prior experience? Yeah, I went in uh, about 10 times from the ages of 13 to 27. 10 times? Yeah. More opportunity to learn the prison system and make new contacts. Is that the... Not how did you use those was, 10 times? That was not my... My motto was never to go to prison and learn more. Uh, but I did learn more. Every time I went in, I came out, you know, with a different strategy that I wanted to yeah, implement to my team and like, oh, this is how we need to do it. Like before, when I went in at, you know, as a kid, like six, 15 or 16, I, I said, we need to dress up and wear suits and ties and stuff like that. Were you reading books to learn how to do this or were you just pondering, you know, how could I do this better by yourself? Yeah, just came up with different ideas, okay. different strategies, and and um, I learned. I mean, I learned how to cut crack, you know, like when I was 14. Somebody taught me that I, that I was in jail with. So. Oh gosh, 14, and this is now in the 80s. Uh, 90s. 90s. Oh, yeah. You're very young. Yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> you're still young. I'm a baby. Yeah. Totally amazing. Okay, so at 23, it got you big time because you're the kingpin, and they really want to throw the book at you because. Yeah. They're probably consider you, you know, enemy number one for the New York City. And yeah. I mean, the war on drugs and you're probably enemy number one yeah. for some, some of the uh, district attorney's office. Yeah. So how much time did you get? I was fortunate to get received seven years in prison. Or you had a good lawyer. Uh, the lawyer was good, but um, it was mainly Governor Spitzer who, uh, you remember when he cheated on his wife with the ex-prostitute. Yes, the prostitute yeah. And, uh, uh, Governor Patterson came into play and, and changed the Rockefeller laws. And when the Rockefeller laws were being changed, I was going back and forth to court. And I was sentenced to seven years and was granted opportunities to come home early. So the Rockefeller law was mandatory, like what, 15 or 20 or more? Uh, yeah, so if you get caught for a certain amount, you're doing life. Life? Yeah. 
oh my gosh, so Spitzer's um, couldn't keep it in his pants helped you out. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting yeah, how fate yeah. uh, comes in. Thank you, Spitzer. Ah, so you got seven years. Did what they send you to where? So I was in Rikers Island fighting my case uh, for about a year, and then I went to uh, um, all over upstate, you know, by Katsaki, Green, Ulster, passed through Elmira, Lakeview. Why, why would you move around? Uh, that's just how the system the works. system works. Yeah. They yeah. don't want you to get too comfortable. Uh, there's places that, there's people that get lucky and they get comfortable. You know, there's people that serve 10, 15 years in one spot and then they get moved. But I, I was also applying for different programs uh, throughout my incarceration system so I could come home early. That's why I was moved around a bit. Oh, okay. So you were yeah. trying to rehabilitate yourself? I was trying you, to come home early. <laughs> come home early and you were gaming the system as much as you could. Yeah. You weren't necessarily being rehabilitated. You, in your mind, you were going to go back to the, to well, the game. I didn't, I didn't want to go back. I didn't, when I went in, I, didn't, I was like, I didn't want to go back uh, primarily because of my, my son who, um, uh, when I went in, he was two years old. And um, and I, I didn't want to give him that that life, you know, okay. of having a dad in prison. And okay. All right. So it's your son helped set the seed. Yeah. So what happened that that changed it? You know, that one moment. There was one moment. Yeah. It's, it's spectacular. Tell yeah. us that story. I was in the unit. Uh, the officer calls me and says, "You have to go report to the medical unit." So I'm walking towards the medical unit, and I get there, and this uh, officer places me on a wall and starts searching me and and then he starts touching me in like inappropriate places and I I, I qu quickly jerked my body and um, as soon as he I did that he excused my language but he said don't fuck with me and like hit me with a closed fist behind my head and knocked me out and uh, I knocked I dropped down to the ground and I got up and I turned around on him and um, he quickly pressed this pin uh, it's this button and there's walkie-talkie and as soon as that button is pressed about a dozen officers come to the scene and 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 they beat the crap out of me and threw me in you know shackled me up threw me in solitary and, and I'm in solitary and I'm going crazy there because I was doing well and and trying to you know go through the whole system I was I only had two months to go home and because of the situation I was facing three more years in prison and I, I didn't you know, I was I was going crazy because I didn't have anybody to communicate with. You know, and, and I, the first thing I, ha you know, did was write a letter because all they give you is paper, pen, and an envelope. So I, I wrote out a letter um, and told my family like I'm not coming home, or like please help me. You know, maybe I could get out of this situation if you contact these people. But then I enclosed the letter and I realized that I didn't have a stamp to send out this letter with. I was like banging my head in the wall. I didn't know what to do. And, and, I was I was being starved. Uh, there's two showers a week, and um, and in 24-hour lockdown, there's nothing to do. You're so bored. Um, you just start looking at cracks in the wall, and they turn into fingerings, and and you know you start messing around with your head, you know. And uh, and a couple of days later, my sister writes me, and she finds out that I'm in solitary confinement. And my sister's like, Mother Teresa's child, like believes in. God and Jesus and you know and like hallelujah everything and uh, she tells me to read Psalm 91 from the Bible and I and I, I take that letter and I basically throw it in the corner of my cell and I'm like you know F that I'm not reading that stuff I don't believe in God whatever I had this Bible that she gave me in the early on in my incarceration so I pick up the Bible and I start reading Psalm 91 and as soon as I laid back on my bed and start reading it, a stamp fell out of the Bible. And it was a stamp that I needed to send out this letter with. And I felt like there was, there was chills. Every time I t mentioned the story, I get chills, but. Really, so you felt that the Holy Spirit was entering your body? I don't know if the Holy Spirit was entering my body, but I felt like there was something bigger than myself. And okay, well, some people call that the Holy Spirit moment. Yeah. That was your Holy Spirit moment. Yeah. Even though you may not realize it. But you kept the Bible because you moved around, so you still kept that Bible for some reason. Yeah. I mean, it was sitting in my cell like a good luck charm that she gave me in when okay. I was in Rikers Island. Okay. You know, and you usually use a Bible to write down all your numbers and 
contacts and stuff like that. Oh, okay. So, so there was all the purposes for the Bible. Yeah. But something else happened. Doctor gave you some devastating news about your personal health. Yeah, that was before the situation happened. Um, before that happened, I was uh, once I get up, once you get upstate, you get medical checkups, blood work, and you already get that in Rikers Island. So I um, I got all this checkup, and they told me that my cholesterol levels was so high that I could probably die in prison within five years. And when they told me that, I, I, I was like, I, was, I didn't believe them and I was like, but I went back to my cell and I started thinking I, and what they recommended was exercising and eating correctly. And um, obviously in prison, you don't get the best food. But, Could family send you food at Rikers? Uh, not in Rikers, no. uh, but upstate, uh, you, get, you get packages. And From I, your family? And I, I was getting packages and Dominican or, food, you know, some of those yeah, platanos. Yeah, the, the, good, the good natural stuff. And I kept running and running and running and working out in my cell. And eventually I lost 70 pounds in six months. And, Amazing. And then I helped over 20 MA2s, over 1,000 pounds combined. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that was the start of what we, that we call con body, which is in the Long yeah. East side. Yeah. Okay. Gosh. Yeah. How long were you in solitary? Uh, 30 days. 30 days. Yeah. My gosh. I, I've been in solitary before, and so, but like the solitary was not what changed me. Okay, know? what changed you? It was definitely that that, that, that step experience. falling out. Yeah. Okay, so and 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 reading the Bible from front to back. Okay, so you again you were yeah. in, in solitary where you had nothing else to read but the Bible. Yeah. And you read it. Okay, and that and that really got to you. Yeah, I, I, I started realizing what I was doing was wrong. And, and uh, for the first time, I started praying and asking God, like, how can I give back to society? And, and that's when I, I said, you know, I'm already helping these guys in the prison yard work out. And I, I could do this when I come home, start, you know, workout program. And, and I started formulating a whole workout routine. And I took the side of the Bible and long sheets of file paper that they give you. And, started drawing lines and a chart and wrote like every day of the week and what I was going to do and that was like my scripture that I followed and agenda that I followed every single day when I came home. Wow, so did almost like a business plan of what you wanted to do. Yeah. All right, so you, you, you got home and you were very fortunate that you, your, your family was accepting you. Your mom was there, and, and, your, and your sister was there. Yeah. Uh, she must have been thrilled that you discovered God, and you were now caused version two coming out. Yeah, my family was happy. I, my siblings didn't really, really believe in my change. Um, they were skeptical. Yeah, because it was just so many times that I came out. and. Well, considering you were in prison 10 times, people give up on, yeah. on, on you. But they were skeptical, but they were accepting. Yeah. Which is which is a strong, I mean, that was a yeah. strong benefit for you. Yeah, my mom believed in me, and and I slept on her couch for a year, you know, when I came home. And then finding work would be very difficult. Yeah. So so how did you start Conbody? I mean, you needed some seed money. Yeah, about two months out of prison, I met this uh, guy. He told me about this program called The Five Ventures, thefiveventures.org. And what they do, they believe that illegal entrepreneurs could become legal entrepreneurs and that we have the transferable skills to start our own businesses. So it's a whole like MBA program that's taught by Harvard and Stanford MBA professors. And I, I joined it and did really well. And through that program, they have like Shark Tank competitions where you pitch investors and you win grant money. So I won a total of like 10 grand throughout the program. And when I won that money, I, I used it to start up Combody. My gosh, you got $10,000. And with some of the people that give you the money, were they investors as well? It was completely just um, grant money. Grant money. Yeah. And you found space. And in fact, the space was the corner where you used to sell drugs. Yeah. We eventually opened up our first gym in the Lower East Side on the exact same corner where I was selling drugs at in Broome and Eldridge. And so how did the customers find you? I went up to every person on the street and was just pitching them and telling them my story. and. I was telling them about what I'm doing, and and then uh, our whole mission was to you know hire formerly incarcerated people too as well. So that became you know our mission at Combody too. And I just it, to today I still pitch people on the street. I got on the F train a few times, D train, and 
Excuse me, gentleman. I'm not looking for money, exactly. but you were one of those guys. I was one of those guys, you know, I did that a few <laughs> Everybody times. Everybody goes, oh, God. I like one of them. But I'm like, I didn't want no money. I just listen up. I just want to. So start. you pass along your business cards like you yeah, did when I, you Yeah, I had did. like little postcards and like I would pass them out in the train. The stereotype is you guys are fit because yeah. you're in there working out. Give you that prison body you always desired. Did you look for, for, for men or women or a specific clientele? Just young professionals that are that were already like working out or coming out of gyms, or uh, basically females that wore yoga pants that went up to and pitched. And, then, and you're a good-looking guy, so half the time they would wanted to listen to you to see what you were about. You know, I got thousands of no's, but you know, it's always getting that couple yeses, and then getting those yeses to turn into more people. And you're you're a natural sales yeah. person. I mean, because yeah. I used to be in sales, and my coach would tell me. For every no you get, you're closer to a yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you're the perfect example. A thousand no's, but you knew there was a yes coming up. Yeah. I'm very optimistic. I, I believe everything's going to work out no matter what. You know, win or fail, I'm, I'm going to okay. be okay. Let's say I'm walking into Con Body, I got your card. How are you going to introduce me to your shop? If you come to the Lower East Side, uh, or, or we open up in Saks Fifth Avenue now. That's so, amazing. Yeah, so... What floor are you on, Saks Fifth Avenue? On the second floor. Second floor. And yeah. it's a real con body with geishas and... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you, it looks like a prison inside Saks Fifth well, How long are you going to be there? Till through October and potentially permanently. Wow. Yeah. That is amazing. About. Anyway, yeah. I walk in Saks yeah. Fifth Avenue. I live nearby. <laughs> we'll tell you, uh, welcome to prison. And uh, we throw you in the cage and... You know, and, and get ready. For a beginner, what kind of what kind of workouts would you do for me? Simple movements, jumping jacks, plank jacks, uh, squat thrusts, up and down. And then we'll do a little bit of the pull-up bar work in certain days and, and kick-ups and stuff like that. Okay. So it's all body weight, no, uh, no equipment. And we actually have our online workout videos for $5 a month where you can virtually work out with you favorite ex-con and your favorite ex-con <laughs> it sounds like peloton you know peloton yeah, with the yeah. cycling so you like the peloton of uh of yeah. ex-cons get yeah. their favorite workout you got some uh, some good one i saw yeah. the story of sultan malik yeah which sultan is, uh, is amazing it's amazing so what's the big advantage of doing that versus going to equinox you build more of a camaraderie at Equinox. You're, you're going in there, you're going to like a fancy locker room. You're not really talking to anybody. You feel like a robot over here. You, we're going to greet you. You're going to meet people. You're going to feel, you're going to have fun. And, and the time of working out is going to go so fast. You're going to be like, oh, wow, I did so much. And you also realize that you're contributing to a social movement, you know, giving people a, a second chance. And oh, you mean you, because your trainers are, are formerly, formerly incarcerated? incarcerated. Yeah. Marnie. And she called yeah. it sweaty fun. Yeah, Marnie's <laughs> amazing. Marnie was working with me too, so we do we do a few run partnerships. So. I know, I know. Because you've been doing the Con Party 5K for three or four years. So yeah. how did that start? That was just an idea that, that I came up with. I was doing like running classes like two or three times a week. And I always wanted like to do some competitive stuff throughout the city. And we would do, we'll do like a bridge and back or two bridges and um you know and, and we will have stations so we'll have like five stations throughout the 5k or 10k and we end up in the studio but it's uh just what do you do at the station pick up water or you do some other no, exercises? some some other uh, exercises like the pull up i have my prison bus where it has like pull up bars on the side of the bus and we have like dips you know we use benches or squat thrusts or you know all types of different we get creative this is a That's unique 5K. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We do that 5K, you wind up at the studio. Is that where you get refreshments and you get your certificate? Yeah, we, we give out like the Combody medals and uh, well, the race five, prison 5K medals. And, um, and sometimes we have like little snacks that we get uh, sponsors and water bottles and stuff like that that we give out. And, and how so, old are you now? I'm 31. 31. Yeah. So you went to prison at 23. You did almost the seven years. So did you let out early five I was, years? I, I did four. You did four, four years. including that extra time. Yeah, so I was supposed to be releasing three. I think only in America you can do this. And now, <laughs> and now you're a spokesperson because I would imagine that politicians would love your story. You know, yeah. come and talk to our kids. What do you tell a youngster that not to go that way, but to go to the, the path of of, of, of what you've gone through, you know, how, how can you reach them? When they're young and they're growing up in, 
bad circumstances, um, you know, they all want to hear about how do I make money, how do I make money, and it's like, you know, you can either do this and it'll lead you to this and this, or you do this and you, it'll take a little bit longer, but it'll be highly successful and I've, I'm already doing it, you know, like, you know, this is not the only route and the richest people in the world are not drug dealers, you know, so. And I tell them like, you know, no matter what, everything's gonna work out. You know, you're gonna wake up, you're gonna eat, you're gonna do what you have to do and, and you're gonna live this life and you're gonna, everybody passes away, but you know, just do the right thing and everything will work out. Like my mom, I feel like my mom is one of the most successful persons I know and she only makes, what, $12 an hour. And I think he's one of your customers, right? And she's she doesn't pay, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't charge your mom. No, I don't charge my mom. I, I understand. You have a, a younger brother. Yeah. And he's running for political office. Yeah, my brother's running for city council and district one. He's knocking on like 300 doors a day. He's he's getting out there. He's are you going to be helping him? Or you are helping? Oh yeah, him? I've been I've been helping him since day one. I see a future for you as a politician. You have the gift of gab. <laughs> And somehow, you, your face is not messed up. I mean, but you've got that modern yeah. looks. Thank you. So I can see why Saks Fifth Avenue would have loved to have you there as, a, you know, as their model. Yeah. <laughs> come, come and look like you. Yeah. You know? And I've Thank seen you. you work out. You know, your, your pull-ups are just amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You're now an entrepreneur. You're a job creator because yeah. you've got the people that you hire. Not only, you know, you welcome people that are formerly incarcerated, but also other, other trainers that want to come. Yeah. I have 17 no. people on my team now. So what do you think of your future? Are you going to open up more, more kind bodies in, in the area, go national? Yeah, our whole plan is to, uh, you know, open up as many kind bodies as we can. And um, we're, we're looking at a spot in Chelsea right now. Um, we're wanting to do L.A. next after that. And then, you know, cover everything in the middle in between uh, Miami, Chicago, D.C., Boston. Jeez, the mayor de Blasio must love you. I haven't spoke to mayor de Blasio, but... Well, he works out in Brooklyn, you know, what was that? He should be coming to Con Yeah, he should be coming to Con Body. Listen, that note, the movement, the Con Body movement. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you.